Good evening. I'm Mas Kaveh, Dean of the College of Science and Engineering, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2019 Kaufmanus Lecture on behalf of the college. Uh, just a few words about the College of Science and Engineering in case you're not familiar with it. Um, the college is unique amongst its peer institutions across the United States in combining physical sciences, mathematics, computer science, and engineering all under the same college. It's a tremendously uh, valuable and um, an important combination as the college trains students across the full spectrum of fundamental science and mathematics uh, discoveries of the universe, as we'll be hearing soon, to engineering innovations. The full range is really covered within the college. Uh, the college is a large one. It's a diverse one in terms of disciplines, as I mentioned, uh, 12 departments, um, over 8,000 undergraduate and graduate students, and uh, some 430 faculty members. Well, I'm honored to um, basically open the uh, Kaufmanis Lecture um, this year. The Kaufmanis Lecture is presented in memory of um, our beloved professor of astronomy, Carlos Kaufmanis, one of the university's um, fabled and greatest teachers, you know, who taught some apparently 26,000 students during his time and is often remembered for his popular Star of Bethlehem lectures. Uh, the late Professor Kaufmanis moved to uh, Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota as an associate professor in 1949. He joined the University of Minnesota as a visiting lecturer in 1961 and became an associate professor in 1963. He held the rank of full professor from 1970 to 1978 when he retired. So I'm, again, delighted to welcome you to this uh, very important lecture and very important annual event. And I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague and director of the Minnesota Institute for Astrophysics, uh, Evan Skillman, to, um, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Evan, thank you. Thank you very much, Moss. I, uh, many of you, I, I don't know whether you know this, but uh, Moss has served in the dean's office for a long time as associate dean, interim dean, and now full dean. And within the college, we're very grateful to him. And his tenure there will be reaching an end. I'm not sure if he'll be able to introduce the next Kaufmanis lecture or not. But I, I think this is your opportunity, if you're interested in thanking someone for the uh, advancement of this university, now is a good time to thank Moss. Uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in favor of very short introductions, and this is not going to be one of them. I'm sorry. <laughs> this, is, this, is, uh, this is just one of my favorite things to do as a director of the Kaufmanis Lecture, is to, you know, to, bring it, to see all of you out here makes me just so happy that we can you know, share this, that our discoveries with you. Um, and this is all possible because of donations uh, that support the Kaufmanis Lecture, and we're very lucky that we have various people here that have donated, and amongst them, uh, Jeff and Dana Pushel uh, made generous contributions that, that allow us to have this, and I, I'd like to just, uh, you know, everyone please thank Jeff. I'm, I'm so pleased that they could be here. But, uh Jeff, Jeff is a, a PhD from our program and has been working in Raytheon for a long time with telescopes that point down, not up. He's uh, done a lot of work on satellites uh, that look at the Earth viewing satellites. He's, not, he's nodding in, in yes and no at the same time, I, I hope. That, and and as, a, as the uh, scientist for uh, uh, the next mission that he's looking at is a launch in 2026 or so, right, for this Glimmer satellite. So, um, uh, you know, we're, we're very proud of, of him and, and very grateful for the support of this program. Oh, all right, to move on, Elliot. Uh, Elliot uh, got his, BA, his, his BS in physics from MIT, his PhD in astronomy from Harvard, then spent two years in Princeton, and then went to UC Berkeley as faculty in 2001. So he was sampling you know, some of the finer institutes across the world. Uh, it, as soon as he got to Berkeley, they started giving him uh, 
various honors. He had a Sloan Fellowship in 2002, a Packard Fellowship in 2003, and then in 2008 he got the Warner Prize from the American Astronomical Society. That's the award that's given annually to one person for significant contributions by a young person, young meaning a number of years since your PhD or under the age of 36. And I would just like to read uh, what it was for. It's for his contributions to plasma astrophysics and accretion processes, the theory of low luminosity galactic nuclei, and an extraordinary range of other topics in theoretical astrophysics. That last phrase, I think, is wonderful. You know, and everything else, you know, <laughs> just kind of. Uh, then in two, 2012, he got an award from the Simmons Foundation, and it said, uh, Elliot is a theoretical astrophysicist physicist whose research combines many areas of physics, including gas dynamics, plasma physics, radiative transfer, and nuclear physics, effective mentor for many students and postdocs, fundamental contributions to the theory of astrophysical turbulence and transport in hot plasmas, and stellar and black hole astrophysics. Um, you have to have a degree to understand what he's gotten all these awards for, I think. It's just, uh, it's, it's quite... And then in, in 2018, he's been uh, elected as a member of the American Ad Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, this evening's work is specifically mentioned in that uh, membership promotion, which I, I think is, is very interesting. And, and one thing I've gotten to appreciate about Elliot from my interactions with him is he, he strikes me as an incredibly, despite all these words, an incredibly modest person. And what I'm afraid is that he'll give this entire talk and explain this great discovery to you and not give you the sense that actually he and his students made predictions about what would be observed well in advance of what was observed. Um, I, don't, I don't want that to go by because when, within astrophysics there are things that are explained after the fact and there are the things that are predicted and then confirmed and those, that latter class of predicting and confirmed are really the most special of, of our discoveries I think and that's the story that he's going to deliver this evening. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Elliot to give the Kaufmanis lecture. <laughs> Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Thank you, Evan, for that very kind introduction. It's really great to be here today and tell you, let's first get this up, yes, okay. Uh, and tell you a little bit about some of the amazing discoveries that have happened really in just the last few years that have come about fundamentally from our ability to see the universe in a new way. And that new way is with this telescope here that doesn't look like the telescopes you'll see after the talk. Uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about how this telescope works as we go. I should say from the start that I'm actually not in the LIGO collaboration. It's a big collaboration, 1,000 or so people. Uh, I don't actually know very much how telescopes work. Um, I do instead the more math and physics and prediction side of things of tr trying to predict what telescopes will see and trying to interpret the observations that are made with a wide variety of telescopes. So that's sort of the lens uh, of how I come at these problems. And some of the work that I've done is, is very much related to what we'll talk about today. Uh, and the amazing story that I wanna tell you is one that's not at all obvious from the start, which is that seeing the universe in a telescope that actually fundamentally tells us something about gravity, that's what this telescope does, as its name suggests, actually also solved a long-standing uh, 60, 70-year-old problem in astrophysics about the origin of the elements. Where do the building blocks for everything here on Earth actually come from? And that's the story that I want to tell you. So to start, uh, I want to apologize that I'm going to take you all the way back to high school chemistry. Um, and, and I should say, uh, I actually did very, very poorly at chemistry. I obviously did okay at physics, uh, but, but not at chemistry. There was a little bit too much to memorize for me. Physics is more reductionist, and that's more consistent with how I thought. But in chemistry, there is sort of a way of organizing our understanding about nature and about how different chemical elements interact and behave, and that's the periodic table. Uh, it organizes elements based on how heavy they are. So hydrogen is the lightest element, uh, consists of just a proton and an electron. 
Helium typically has two protons, two neutrons, and is surrounded by two electrons. And then as you go heavier and heavier in the periodic table to things that I'm sure you're all familiar with, like dysprosium and neodymium and berkelium and elements like that up here in the periodic table, those elements are actually made mostly of neutrons with some protons and then this cloud of electrons around the atom. In chemistry, we think about these elements in the periodic table in terms of how they interact, why certain things are better at undergoing chemical reactions, uh, at powering uh, lithium-ion batteries and things like that. Uh, in physics, we break these things down even more into quarks and strings and things like that. But in astrophysics, one of the quests that we've been trying to understand is where does all of this come from? What objects out there in the universe are the source that produce the hydrogen, the helium, the carbon in our bones, the oxygen we breathe, and the iron in our blood? And if I were to kind of distill the essence of that quest down into two parts, I would say that what we've understood over the course of about a century of work is that the lightest elements in the periodic table, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, those were produced in the earliest phase of the universe as we know it, the Big Bang, when the universe was incredibly hot and incredibly dense. Uh, things like protons and neutrons combined to form the helium nucleus, and some of those combined to form the lithium nucleus, but it stopped there. So we didn't get, in the earliest history of the Big Bang, we didn't get past, really, lithium in the periodic table. The universe had to wait for hundreds of millions of years until the first stars formed and until the first stellar explosions occurred. And it's really only in the interiors of stars and in stellar explosions that the conditions are right that you can build up all of the other heavy elements in the periodic table from the light elements that were produced during the Big Bang. And the reason for that, that combining elements, really a sort of alchemy, uh, like Newton and the Greeks before him were trying to do, we now know that that's extremely difficult to do under conditions like we find here on Earth. But it is possible to combine light elements to form heavy elements if you have extremely high temperatures and extremely high densities like you have deep in the interiors of stars or during stellar explosions. And indeed, we now know that the light of the sun is produced by hydrogen fusing to form helium in the core of the sun. That generates heat that eventually makes its way to the surface and has kept the sun hot and hence the Earth hospitable for billions of years. So this is sort of in brief, in a nutshell, this is our understanding of where we think all of these different building blocks of everything here on Earth, right? Uh, the, literally our bodies, but also my laptop, this building, right? They were produced by a combination of these processes out there in the universe, and eventually elements produced by these processes got collected into the cloud of gas that collapsed to form the solar system, the sun, and the planets. But there's been a part of this story that we've not understood very well, a sort of missing part of the story. And it's basically where many of these heaviest elements in the periodic table originated. Some of them you're familiar with, gold, the gold that's on uh, many of our wedding bands, uh, uranium, platinum, also in, used in jewelry, right? Those are among these elements in the periodic table that are heavy with mostly neutrons compared to protons. We haven't understood where in the universe they're produced. And there's other elements that you're not as familiar with that you really haven't probably heard about before. Yttrium, neodymium, gadolinium, europium, dysprosium, those are all real elements in the periodic table. And those are actually critical to a lot of modern technology. These are called the rare earth elements, and they're in your phone. They keep the, phone, the screen of your phone bright. Uh, they're used in a variety of modern uh, te technological processes. So although they're rare, they're technologically very important. So just to give you a sense of how common these are, 
A couple months ago, I got frustrated by the fact that whenever I went out to my grill to cook something, I didn't have anywhere to put my grill tools. So I went on Amazon to look for magnets that I could put on the side of my grill uh, to attach my grill tools. And what do you know? But the magnets that are the best for this are actually made out of neodymium. Neodymium magnets, and neodymium is one of these unusual elements in the periodic table whose origin, where in the universe it is produced, we have not understood really until the last few years. So what's amazing is that something that seems totally unrelated, looking at the universe with a telescope that sees basically gravity rather than light, uh, helped shed enormous light, no pun intended, onto this puzzle about the origin of the elements. And so to tell you that, I want to kind of explain to you a little bit about what uh, these gravitational waves are, these waves associated with gravity, how we detect them, and how we've uh, solved, or at least partially solved, this puzzle about the origin of the elements using these observations. So first, I just want to remind you that historically, starting from ancient Babylonian and Greek astronomers, when we look up at the sky, what we're seeing is light. Most of the advances in modern astronomy come from our ability to see light better and better and better, and to see different types of light. Because light, it turns out, comes in many different forms things that you've heard of, radio waves that literally some of your uh, car radios used to detect uh, before there were iPods, uh, x-rays, the same x-rays that your dentist and doctor uses, right? These are all forms of light. Light in its basic form is a combination of electricity and magnetism that travels through space as a wave, and we distinguish the type of light based on basically how long it takes this pattern of repeating electric field and magnetic field to repeat itself in space and time. So radio waves are waves where the pattern of electric field and magnetic field repeats itself sometimes over tens of feet, so very large distances. Visible light, the stuff we can see with our eye, uh, is wavelengths of like 500 billionths of a meter, and then x-rays are much smaller than that. But to a physicist, these are all fundamentally the same thing. Now, what's astonishing, and what has taught us a tremendous amount about the universe, is that if you look at the same object in the universe, with a radio telescope, a visible telescope, or an x-ray telescope, you get a fundamentally different view of what that object looks like. These are literally exactly the same place in the sky, and the images are the same scale. Okay? And yet you see fundamentally different things about the universe by looking at the universe in different ways. In this case, with different types of light. In the radio, you're seeing a black hole at the center of this galaxy spewing out material in what we call jets, which heat up the surrounding space. In the visible, you're seeing uh, thousands of galaxies orbiting around each other. Each of these regions has itself billions of stars. And in the x-rays, you're seeing that what looks like empty space between those galaxies is actually filled with hot gas that glows in the x-rays. And there's actually more mass in this hot gas than in all the hundreds of billions of stars in every galaxy in that image in the center. And so this just highlights that one of the enduring quests in astronomy in the last century has been to try to look at the universe in new ways. Because every time we look at the universe with different types of light or in other new ways, we find new discoveries. And that's a central theme of the story that I'll tell you about, which is looking at the universe not in light, but looking at the universe in what are called gravitational waves, waves that are associated with gravity. So these are waves that are fundamentally different from light. They have nothing to do with electricity and magnetism. They're intimately related to gravity. And one way I like to think about this is imagine that you're somewhere out in the audience or billions of light years away, and you're looking at these two objects that are moving around each other. How do you actually know if if the only information you have is gravity, how do you know that the two objects are moving around? that they're not just sitting there still. 
The answer is the fact that they're moving around is communicated out into the universe because gravity changes in time. As these two objects go around each other, the strength of gravity, as seen by a distant observer, will subtly change in time as the or objects orbit around. And the way we think of this is that the information about the changing gravity travels out into space in the form of a wave, a wave that communicates the changing strength of gravity to the rest of the universe. And that pattern showing the changing strength, strength of gravity is sort of illustrated schematically here, where you can think about sort of the peaks, the top of the crest is a region where gravity is a little bit stronger, just because of where the two objects happen to be in their orbit, and the troughs are where gravity is a little bit weaker, and so on, and the pattern repeats itself every time these objects go around. You'll also often hear gravitational waves referred to as ripples in space-time, uh, and that's because our modern understanding of gravity is a bit more sophisticated than sort of the story I gave you here. It's ultimately due to Einstein. Uh, Einstein, in, 19, in the early 1900s, developed what he called the special theory of relativity. And then in 1916, he developed what is called his general theory of relativity. And this is many things, and among them, it is a more modern and more sophisticated understanding of gravity than what Newton taught us. And in that theory, gravity is really a manifestation of the structure of space itself. And so what's happening as this wave travels out is that literally the structure of space is changing a little bit. Things are getting a little closer together, a little further apart, a little closer together, a little further apart as this wave travels out. And that's where the name ripples in space-time comes from. For the most part, for the story that I'll tell you, this sort of, I would say, slightly more intuitive Newtonian, not quite right, but nonetheless a little more intuitive picture uh, will suffice. Okay. So imagine that you wanted to observe in nature some object that would produce these gravitational waves. You might think, great, the moon is going around the Earth. Maybe that produces a source of gravitational waves that we could go build a telescope and detect. It turns out that to physicists, the gravity between the Earth and the moon is pretty weak. And so we're not able to detect currently the gravitational waves produced by the motion of the Earth around the moon. So what that means is that what you want, if you want to have a chance of seeing out there in the universe some source that produces gravitational waves, you want it to be something whose gravity is stronger than that of the Earth and the moon, or the moon, or the Earth and the sun, or Jupiter and the sun. So you, you need to look at the objects in the universe that produce the strongest gravitational pulls that we know of. And those turn out to be very exotic objects. Objects that you're not uh, familiar with from your everyday experience. What are called neutron stars and black holes. These are the objects in the universe that produce the strongest gravitational pull. So a neutron star is a star that in some ways is sort of like the sun. It typically has a mass similar to the mass of the sun, but it's very different from the sun in that its size is comparable to the size of a typical city, say Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, something like that. And so what that means is the mass of the sun is shrunk into a region that is about 100,000 times smaller than the sun. So the matter in a neutron star is smushed together a thousand trillion times denser than the matter in the sun. And one manifestation of that is that neutron stars are not made of what the sun is made of. The sun is made of mostly hydrogen, protons, with some helium, protons and neutrons. Neutron stars, as their name suggests, are made mostly of neutrons. In fact, they're not made perfectly of neutrons. They're made also a little bit of protons, a little bit of electrons, but they're made mostly of neutrons. And these objects, because they have a large mass and are in a very small region, they have a strong gravitational pull. Gravity is stronger if you either have more stuff or if you have the same amount of stuff but in a smaller region, that creates a larger gravitational pull. The other objects 
Uh, and I should say, this is an artist's conception. That's not a real picture of a neutron star. I didn't think I needed to put artist conception labels here. Uh, this is from an old Disney movie. This is from some weird, actually, graphic. Actually, it's an interesting graphic novel. It has very little to do with black holes. It has more to do with uh, socially disaffected teenagers who turn into zombies and various things like that. Okay. Not important for what follows. So black holes really are more extreme even than neutron stars. They're objects where gravity has won. Gravity has won out over every other force we know about in the universe. And so the object has collapsed in on itself to become basically just a manifestation of gravity. So black holes are weird in many ways. They're very different from our everyday experience. For instance, we often talk about the size of a black hole. And what we mean by that is the size of the so-called event horizon. The event horizon is the region within which no information, not even traveling at the speed of light, can escape, can get out of that object. So if you are inside here and you're trying to say hello to your friends outside, that information that you're trying to say hello can never get to them. It is trapped by the strong gravity of the black hole. But unlike normal stars or planets like the Earth, there's actually nothing at the event horizon. There's no matter there. All the matter has been shrunk deep into the center of the object, okay? Because the strength of gravity has won out over anything that could keep matter at the event horizon. So these two objects, then, are the strongest sources of gravity we know of in the universe. They produce the strongest gravitational pulls. And what you want, if you want to have a source that would produce a large amount of gravitational waves on the sky, you basically want neutron stars and black holes to be doing this gravitational dance. You want two neutron stars, two black holes, or maybe a neutron star and a black hole to be spiraling around each other like shown in this movie here. This is actually a computer simulation of what happens if you have two black holes close to each other Unlike the Earth going around the sun, where the Earth happily spirals around the sun for billions and billions of years, okay, two black holes close to each other, what actually happens is that the two black holes spiral closer and closer and closer to each other and eventually collide, forming a new black hole. So you end up with, you end up with one final black hole having started from the two initial black holes. And this is actually a computer simulation that solves Einstein's equations of general relativity for the motion of the two black holes. This blue and yellow uh, pattern here shows you, again, a sort of visualization of the strength of gravity, the strength of these gravitational waves. So you can think of it as that yellow is a region of strong gravity, strong gravitational waves. Blue is a region of weaker gravity, weaker gravitational waves. And that pattern repeats itself as these objects spiral into each other and orbit around each other. On the bottom here is another way of visualizing the same information, where now what's shown is sort of the strength of gravity versus time. So as time goes on, the strength of gravity between the two black holes, as represented by the strength of gravitational waves going out into space, gets larger. That's because the two black holes get closer to each other, gravity gets stronger, the strength of gravitational waves gets stronger. The other thing you'll notice in the inset down here at the bottom is that as time goes on, the pattern repeats itself more quickly. Why is that? That's because when two objects are close to each other, they orbit each other faster. Mercury is closer to the sun, and it orbits much more often around the sun than the Earth does. And so those basic properties of gravity, that gravity is stronger when things are closer together and things orbit more quickly when things are closer together, is encoded in the information about gravitational waves as they travel out into space. And you actually get a very similar pattern if you have two neutron stars orbiting around each other. There are some subtle differences that... Uh, I can talk about if people are interested. Okay, so how would you detect gravitational waves? Well, they're fundamentally different from light, and so you have to build a telescope that really is fundamentally different from any telescope that's been built before. So this is indeed the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or one of the two U.S. versions of LIGO. 
There are two of these telescopes, one in uh, Washington, Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, Louisiana. I'll get to why there's two in a second. The original ideas for how to detect gravitational waves, it actually, the history goes back a little further, but the modern uh, notions of how to do this were developed in the 1970s. Uh, that was when the initial research and development was done on building one of these telescopes. The initial telescope was built in 1999, and over the years, they've been making the telescope better and better and better, until in 2015, the kind of modern version of LIGO went live, went online, uh, called Advanced LIGO after initial LIGO. Um, and soon after, uh, as we'll see, soon after this advanced version of the telescope went online, there were detections of colliding black holes. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm a theorist, so I don't actually build telescopes or in detail, I don't actually understand a lot of the things that go into this, but I have to say that I think that uh, people who can design and build new telescopes are really the pinnacles of science in my view, because it's those uh, ability to develop new ways of looking at the universe, be it a new telescope that looks at light, or a new gravitational wave telescope, that's fundamentally what drives the field forward. And so I think this is really an amazing triumph of physics and engineering that is widely regarded, not just by people who do LIGO, but by the entire physics community, to be probably the hardest physics experiment that's ever been done. And so just to give you a sense of how hard this is, let me give you a flavor for what they're actually measuring. So, in these long tubes, there are lasers bouncing light back and forth. The lasers are bouncing light back and forth between mirrors, and what LIGO is fundamentally measuring is it's measuring the distance between the mirrors. What it wants to see is that when a gravitational wave passes by the Earth, it causes the distance between the mirrors to change a little bit because the structure of space, the strength of gravity changes a little bit. So it measures precisely, extraordinarily precisely, the distance between these mirrors. It measures the distance between the mirrors to an accuracy that's better than a thousand times smaller than the size of a proton. Another way to think about this is, what is the nearest star to us? No, what's the nearest star to us? Okay, good, the sun. But right, Proxima Centauri is the one I was talking about. Um, so Proxima Centauri is the other nearest star system to us. It's a few light years away. And LIGO measures the distance between the mirrors that's equivalent to measuring the distance to Proxima Centauri to an accuracy that's about the width of a human hair. It's just an unbelievable experiment. And it's a very hard experiment because there's lots of other things that cause the distance between the mirrors to change. For instance, if a truck drives by, that causes the ground to shake a little bit, and so that causes the distance between the mirrors. The Earth, as we know in California, isn't so steady. It has earthquakes, um, and so that causes the distance between the mirrors to change. And that's actually why they built two of them, so you would know you were looking at a real source out there in the universe and you weren't detecting trucks going by or people logging in the forest near the Washington detector, which causes you know, significant noise in the detector. Okay. So, uh, actually, very soon after the Advanced LIGO telescope turned on in 2015, uh, they detected uh, two colliding black holes. Uh, really an amazing result um, that I think really captured the attention both of the public and the entire scientific community. And the actual measurement of what LIGO measured is shown at the bottom here. This is sort of a very artistic rendering of what was going on as the two black holes collided to form a new final black hole left after the collision. This is actually the data from the two telescopes, the one in Louisiana and the one in Washington. I don't remember which is which. which, is which. Um, and what this is measuring is the distance between the mirror, which is the strength of the gravitational waves as measured by the telescope. And what I want you to notice is that this has exactly the features that were predicted by the computer simulation of the colliding black holes. As time goes on, the signal gets stronger because the black holes get closer to each other, gravity gets stronger. And as time goes on, the pattern repeats itself more quickly because things orbit faster when they're closer together. 
So the other thing I haven't told you is I haven't told you how long this whole thing took. How long did this process happen? The answer is about a second. And we can actually use how long this took to figure out the masses of the two black holes. And the reason is that if the black holes are bigger, they, it takes them longer to orbit each other. If you have two million solar mass black holes orbiting around each other and colliding, it takes them hours to orbit around each other. If you have two one solar mass black holes orbiting around each other and colliding, it takes about a millisecond. If you have two 30 solar mass black holes orbiting each other, it takes about a second. So knowing that what the actual amount of time the observations were done over, we can deduce that this was the collision between two 30 solar mass black holes. And since then, LIGO has actually now dozens of colliding black holes that they've detected, not just this original detection. And there's a huge amount of incredibly interesting science that can be done with this. So another sort of interesting tidbit is that it turns out that if two black holes that each initially weighed 30 times the mass of the sun collide with each other, what's left behind after that is not what you might have guessed. What you might have guessed is 30 plus 30 equals 60. You might guess you'd be left with a black hole at the end that weighs about 60 times the mass of the sun. And that's close, but not quite right. The right answer is closer to 57. Okay, so where did that mass go? Well, the answer is Einstein's equals mc squared. As the two black holes orbit around each other, they're sending these gravitational waves out into space, and those gravitational waves carry away energy, and that energy comes at the expense of the final mass of the black holes. So there was an amount of energy that went out into space in gravitational waves that's equivalent to the mass of three of our suns. Right? That's really an amazing uh, number. Okay, so now I'm going to turn and tell you about colliding neutron stars, not colliding black holes. And there was a huge amount of excitement in the astronomical community, not just in the possibility that LIGO would detect colliding black holes, but also in the possibility that LIGO would detect colliding neutron stars or also a neutron star colliding with a black hole. And the reason is that when black holes collide, it's basically just gravity involved. We don't know of a way when two black holes collide, we don't know of a way, especially black holes of the masses that LIGO sees, we don't know of a way to produce a bright source of light. Okay? Because black holes are basically just gravity, they don't have anything to do with electricity and magnetism, they don't have a way of producing light. Neutron stars, on the other hand, are made of matter, and matter produces light. So you could imagine that colliding neutron stars would have a way of producing light. And the reason the astronomical community was excited about this is basically the reason I told you at the beginning of the talk. When we look at the universe in different ways, we get different information. So imagine being able to look at the collision of two neutron stars, not just in the information gravity gives us, but also in the information light gives us. That would give us very different complementary views of what's going on. And so there was a huge amount of excitement about this possibility, and uh, as it has continued to do, LIGO very much delivered. So on August 17th, about two years ago now, LIGO detected the collision of two neutron stars. The collision happened in a galaxy about 100 million light years away, which is actually pretty close. Um, we thought LIGO would detect colliding neutron stars a little further than that. This was closer than we expected, which was great, because that meant it's easier to see the light from the collision. And so astronomers uh, looked on the sky where the colliding neutron stars uh, where the neutron stars had collided, and actually figuring out where it was kind of hard, and I can come back to that if people are interested. But eventually they figured out where to look for where the colliding neutron stars had happened, and it turned out that at that place on the sky, this little source of light right there, there was a new source of light that was not there before the two colliding neutron stars happened, and it was not there a week later. This is about a day after the collision as measured by the gravitational waves. 
This is about a week later, and if I were to show you an image a week before, it would look like this, nothing. So this here, this is the galaxy in which the collision happened, hundreds of billions of stars, and this is this new source of light produced by the collision between the neutron stars. This is probably the single most well-studied source, new source of light, something that arose and then disappeared, the single most well-studied source of light uh, in the history of astronomy. Uh, every telescope that could look at this looked at this, and almost every telescope uh, saw something interesting. So this was studied from the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum all the way to the gamma ray part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Telescopes on every continent on Earth, including the South Pole, Hawaii, um, Australia, Africa, you name it, uh, something like 70 telescopes on Earth, uh, looked at the light produced by the colliding neutron stars. Every telescope in space that could look at it looked at it. And we learned an astonishing amount of information from just this one single event. And there's a lot of science that I could tell you about. I've had to cherry pick a few particularly exciting things related to this theme of the origin of the elements. And so that's what I'll, I'll give you a flavor of. Uh, there was so much interest in this event that almost all of the astronomers uh, in the world got involved in studying this event. So something like, it turns out, about a third of the professional astronomers in the world uh, ended up on scientific papers related to this discovery. So really a huge amount of community excitement and engagement. So I want to give you a sense of what does it mean for a third of the astronomers in the world to be on a paper, and it's pretty amazing. So when we write papers, we have different types of papers. When we have a really exciting new result that we want to tell the rest of the community, we write what is called a letter. And a letter is basically meant to be a really short paper, where you distill the essence of the results as much as you can into a few pages, because you can finish it quickly and get it published quickly. So this is one of the letters that appeared from the discovery of the colliding neutron stars. This is called multi-messenger observations of a binary neutron star merger. Multi-messenger means light is one messenger, gravity is the other messenger. Those are the two messengers in this case. Letters are typically about four pages long. This one is 109 pages long. So why is that? That's not because there's 109 pages of science. There's actually about four pages of science. The reason is the remaining 105 pages are filled up with the names of all of the astronomers who are involved in studying this event, the names of the universities that they're at, and what actually took up the most space, the names of all of the people who provided money for the research for all of the authors who were on the paper. So that's what happens when you have a third of the world's astronomers. Papers go from four to 109 pages in length. Okay, so let's go back to this light, and let me tell you what we, how we think this light from the colliding neutron stars was produced, and what we were able to learn from it. So this new source of light in the sky that wasn't there before the collision of the two neutron stars and was there for a few days afterwards and then it faded away. Uh, this is actually related in some ways to other things that we see in the sky uh, that were actually studied by ancient astronomers called novae and supernovae. Novae stands for new source of light. Supernovae stands for really, really, really bright new source of light. Okay. Uh, and this is a related phenomena, we think, and I'll kind of take you through that. So the way we think that this light was produced, and I should say, this picture here is a picture taken with a telescope that looks at light that's similar to but slightly longer in wavelength than the light that our eye can see. So this is called infrared wavelength. So it's similar to what our eye can see but slightly longer wavelengths. What we think happened is that during the collision of the two neutron stars, the two neutron stars spiral in and collide, and they leave behind something after that. What they probably leave behind in this case and in most cases is a black hole. It turns out you can't have neutron stars that are too massive. If you try to create a three solar mass neutron star, it collapses to form a black hole. 
So they spiral in, collide, produce probably a black hole left behind after the collision. But during the process of material, of the two neutron stars spiraling in, some small amount of material is actually flung out into space. And that material gets flung out into space by a variety of different processes. And it's actually, one of those processes is not that different from the fact that if you take a snowball, uh, I've been told this happens since I'm from Berkeley, we don't have snow, sorry. Okay, you take a snowball, right, and you throw it against a wall, and most of it sticks, but there's a bit of splat that flies back out. And that's similar to what goes on in this process. Two neutron stars spiral in, they collide, and some small amount of debris is flung out into space. And by small amount, I mean, you know, something like a few percent of the mass of the two neutron stars. So a few percent of the mass of the sun, which is like 10 times the mass of Jupiter. So that's how much stuff is flung out into space. What happens is that as that material goes out into space, it's initially mostly neutrons with a little bit of protons. But as it expands out into space, it starts to combine to form heavier elements. It starts to undergo nuclear fusion very much the way the early phase of the expanding universe gives us helium and lithium starting from protons and neutrons. The difference here is that you're starting from mostly neutrons and a little bit of protons and electrons. Well, what elements can you make if you start with mostly neutrons and a little bit of protons and electrons? You can make the elements in the periodic table that are mostly neutrons and uh, comparatively few protons and electrons. And those are those very rare elements in the periodic table whose origin we had not understood. Uranium, gold, platinum, neodymium, unanilium, etc. So we think that this cloud of debris flung out into space actually starts out as mostly neutrons and protons, but in a few seconds, actually, as it expands outwards, those neutrons and protons combine to form these heavy elements in the periodic table, uh, such as the ones I've indicated there. So now we have this sort of cloud of debris expanding out into space that's gold, platinum, berkelium, uranium, etc. Some of the elements that are created aren't stable. They don't just sit there forever in the form that they were made. They actually undergo radioactive decay. So what's actually created then in the collision between neutron stars is a radioactive debris cloud, something that would actually be extraordinarily bad for us to be very close to, uh, just like it would not be great for us to be too close to nuclear reactors because of the radioactivity that they produce. But in astronomy, this radioactivity is awesome. Okay? And the reason is that radioactivity produces heat, just like it does in nuclear reactors. So what happens is this debris cloud expands out, and it's kept hot. It's kept hot by the radioactive decay of a bunch of the elements that produced in the collision. And the reason that's important is that if it's ultimately hot gas that produces light in the universe. The sun is basically just a hot ball of gas. Jupiter is basically just a hot ball of gas. So the collision between the two neutron stars flings out into space this cloud of radioactive debris that is kept hot by the decays of the very elements that were produced in the collision. And what I've illustrated schematically here is how the brightness of this debris cloud would look as a function of time. At early times, it's not very bright because the light has a lot of trouble getting out of this debris cloud. It's too dense. The light is sort of stuck in there. But as time goes on and the debris cloud expands outward, eventually the light can get out more easily. So this new source of light would look bright on the sky. And then over time, most of the radioactive decays have happened, and so it starts to fade away. And this takes, according to these calculations, uh, this takes about a few days. The two curves here, this is in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The blue is in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it looks a, diff a little bit different in different types of light. Okay. And so that, we think, is the fundamental origin of this new source of light in the sky. It really is the observational manifestation of the heavy elements that were created in this cloud of debris flung out into space. 
One of the things we've learned how to do very well in astronomy, starting actually with the sun and then moving to other objects, is we've learned how to interpret the light we see from objects and figure out what those objects are made of. Okay. Figure out what is the chemical composition of the objects producing the light that we're looking at. And that's true in this case as well. We can use the detailed properties of the light that was seen, the fact that the blue light went up faster and faded away more quickly than the somewhat redder light, which went up more slowly and faded more slowly. We can use that to constrain how much matter was blown off into space during this event and how much of some of the different elements were actually produced. And when we do that accounting, what we infer is that this single pair of colliding neutron stars flung out into space something like about 3% the mass of the sun of material was flung out into space. And this one event alone flung out into space about 100 times the mass of the Earth worth of gold and platinum alone. And something like, okay, this is a bit of a Berkeley-centric fact, but in case you're interested, uh, something like about the mass of the moon uh, worth of berkelium and some of those unusual, extremely rare, heavy elements in the periodic table. And we don't understand exactly how often neutron stars collide. It's probably about once every 10,000 years or once every 100,000 years in a galaxy like our own and like the galaxy in which this one happened. But if we take that rate of collisions and this much gold and platinum flung out into space per event, this is enough to produce all of the gold and all of the platinum that's seen in all of the stars that we see in the universe. So it's at least consistent with the idea that neutron star collisions are indeed the dominant source of gold, platinum, and these unusual neutron-rich heavy elements. Okay. So what I want to end by doing, and Evan alluded to this uh, kindly at the beginning of the talk, I want to end by giving you a couple of slightly different perspectives on this discovery. So I've highlighted this discovery as a, an experimental triumph, which it absolutely was, right? It really was an experimental triumph, both of gravitational wave science and electromagnetic science. But in fact, science usually proceeds the most effectively when there's a, an interplay between our observational and experimental discoveries and our theoretical understanding. That interplay between the theoretical discoveries and the observational discoveries is part of what enables science to move forward. If you don't have observations to test your theories, you get stuck. And if you don't have a theoretical framework for interpreting your observations, it's hard to make sense of them. So it turns out that actually, the light from colliding neutron stars, how bright they would look on the sky, what elements would be produced, how much material would be flung off during the merger, this was all actually correctly predicted in the decade prior to LIGO making its measurement in 2017. So why? Okay, why were people interested in what sounds like a sort of esoteric question? Well, I mean, I think the, the shortest answer is that we knew LIGO was coming, we knew it was operating, and so we were interested in making predictions for what you would see if LIGO detected colliding neutron stars and you looked at that place in the sky with a telescope that could detect light. And so this actually shows the prediction. The red curve here is the prediction from the 2010 paper that my then graduate student Brian Metzger, who's now a professor at Columbia, where we made the original predictions for how bright the light from colliding neutron stars would be, uh, the red is the prediction from our original paper, and the black, sorry, the blue points are the actual observational detections associated with the 2017 event. So this is a case, uh, you know, it goes both ways. Sometimes the observational discoveries lead the theoretical predictions. This is a case where actually the theoretical predictions led the observational discoveries. And what that meant is it meant that when the observations were made, we were able to able to have a much more detailed and a much richer theoretical interpretation of what was going on and what the observations were telling us because we had laid the theoretical groundwork over the decade leading up to the observational discoveries. 
So the last perspective I want to leave you with is that Carl Sagan famously said that we are all star stuff. And what he meant by that is basically what I alluded to in the early part of the talk, that the basic building blocks for life here on Earth, oxygen, iron, nitrogen, carbon, right? Those were all fundamentally produced by stellar processes. They were produced by nuclear fusion in stars, which combines light elements to form heavy elements, and then they were ejected out into space by stellar winds and stellar explosions. Uh, stellar explosions themselves create uh, new elements because they heat material to billions of degrees. All those elements created in stars and stellar explosions accumulate into gas clouds. Those gas clouds then collapse to form new stars and planets. So literally, the carbon in our bones was formed in a star somewhere probably billions of years before the solar system formed. And it was then in the gas cloud out of which the solar system formed. And then it ended up here on Earth and it eventually got into our bodies. Another way to say this, that uh, Martin Rees, uh, a colleague at Cambridge University in England, has famously said, is that we are all nuclear waste. <laughs> We're all basically the accidental byproducts of all of this fancy nuclear fusion stuff going on in stars. And what we've learned from this LIGO discovery is that literally inside every one of us, there is a little bit of material that was produced billions and billions of years ago in some colliding neutron stars that ejected debris out into space. And that debris accumulated into the gas cloud that formed the solar system, and it ended up in the sun and the Earth. Our cells actually have a little bit of gold. The human body has uh, less than a milligram or so of gold in it. And those, we think, were produced in some of these colliding neutron stars in the distant past. And then lastly, what I think is actually even more amazing is it turns out, uh, I know this from teaching a class with a geologist, we teach a class on the origin of the universe and the origin and history of the Earth, it turns out that uranium is actually extremely important for uh, the existence of life on Earth. And in particular, you may know that the interior of the Earth actually boils. This is called mantle convection. The interior of the Earth continually churns. It takes a long time. It's not like a boiling pot of water where it boils every 10 seconds or a second. It takes hundreds of millions of years for it to boil around, but it does boil. That produces things like volcanoes and, again, things we don't like in California like earthquakes. Fundamentally, that boiling is responsible for plate tectonics, the motion of the plates. Okay. And it's also responsible for the long-term carbon cycle, which keeps the right amount of carbon in the Earth's atmosphere. And by right amount, I mean the amount that is appropriate to have a balance between uh, plants that take in, uh, get, undergo photosynthesis and produce uh, the oxygen that we breathe. And if it weren't for plate tectonics, then it would be difficult for the Earth's atmosphere to regulate the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere because volcanoes produce carbon out into the atmosphere and then plates bring the carbon back down deeper into the interior. And what keeps the Earth boiling? A decent amount of what keeps the Earth boiling is that uranium is radioactive, so it decays. So uranium is a heat source that generates heat in the interior of the Earth and drives the boiling motion of the interior of the Earth. So there is a rather literal sense in which we owe uh, the existence of our lovely habitable planet uh, to the fact that billions of years ago, neutron stars merged, created uranium, and flung that uranium out into space. Okay, so I'll uh, end there, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Uh, so you had a slide with the two blue and red lines with the two black holes. Um, you said you could estimate the masses of the black holes. Can you estimate the masses of each black hole or just kind of the sum of the total black holes in that event? Yeah, so the, the question is, I said from, <clears throat> from, the, from these observations, and in particular the total time that this took, we could estimate the masses of the black holes. It turns out that you measure extremely precisely 
a weird particular combination of the masses of the two objects, that the gravitational wave signal is sensitive to first approximation, it's sensitive to a particular combination of the two masses, and then you measure not quite as precisely the total mass of the system. In this case, because the observations were very good, they had a lot of signal, you could actually measure pretty accurately the masses of the two black holes. And statistically, I don't remember the exact numbers, statistically they were both consistent with about 30 solar masses. One was probably slightly bigger, 32, 28, something like that. Hi, I have two questions. Uh, one of them, uh, you had the uh, uh, double slide of the uh, colliding uh, neutron stars. I did a little thing with my eyes where I crossed them like you do with 3D pictures. And all the stars were in the same spot except for one that was upper left and it had moved. Why would that be or is that just an optical illusion or what? And the other one is... You're talking about this image? Yeah, right. The one okay, so I haven't noticed that before, so I'm staring at it right now. Um, upper left. Yeah, it's about okay. two-thirds so, of the way up to the uh, left a little bit. There's no way that a star moved, in the t meaning the stars that you could see here wouldn't move. So um, one of my observer colleagues might be able to help me. I would guess that, which one is it? Uh, yeah, right there. There? I think that's the same star. Yeah, I think it's the same star. So you could not, there are, you can definitely, if you take very good pictures spread out over years, you can see the stars move. There's a satellite that the Europeans launched called Gaia that does just this. But over, um, over just a couple of weeks for you know, a distant galaxy like this, I think it's very unlikely you'd be able to see. I can see, see a, just looking at them both. The okay. One on the right. Okay. Okay, the other question I got is um, you feel that uranium or some radioactive material is at the center of the Earth? Yeah. With the half-life of these radioactive materials and the Earth is about four and a half billion years old, you would think that it would all have been depleted by then. Yeah, so conveniently the half-life of uranium is about four and a half billion years. So it's just... <laughs> That's one of those lucky coincidence of physics. There are elements with a wide range of half-lives. The elements that are important for the radioactive heating that powered the light are elements that have half-lives of a day because we're observing the thing over a day, so it has to decay on a day. And there are half-lives that range from tiny fractions of a second to longer than the age of the universe. If you measure gravitational waves, uh, how do you identify and uh, separate out one event from all the waves that must be floating around through the universe? Yeah, great question. So how do you, how do you detect a single event from the accumulation of all of the events that have happened in the history of the universe? Um, so the answer is you need that single event to be close enough that it stands out above the background of all of the others. And in fact, right now, um, what you're seeing here, so this is the signal standing out above the background. This background is actually instrumental noise. The telescope isn't perfect. It's totally amazing, right? But it's not perfect. So there's a little bit of jitter left. Uh, that creates this background level of noise. So they're not yet at the sensitivity, although there's work, in fact, going on here, trying to detect that cumulative signal from all of the collisions that have happened throughout the history of the universe. So that's something that there's a lot of interest in trying to see. Um, I'm guessing that when these heavy elements are formed, they're pretty hot. So I'm wondering if there's an idea how they end up sort of in clumps in planets like the Earth. Yeah, so good question. So the, what form do the elements take? Um, how do they end up in clumps in planets? So the, I sort of didn't get into this, but I don't want you to have the picture that there's like 
a hundred Earth mass gold nugget out there floating through space, okay? It's really a gaseous cloud of gold in its uh, gaseous atomic form. It probably is not in solid form. It might, some of it might be able to turn solid. This happens in exploding stars if you wait long enough, but it's probably mostly in gaseous form. So all of the interesting structure of the elements on the Earth you know, mines and veins of heavy elements and things like that, those are a consequence of geologic processes. The, the elements have been, during the process of forming the Earth, the elements have been reheated, the Earth became molten, and so the kind of where the elements are and their morphology, whether they're in, you know, gold veins or things like that, is, I think, shaped really entirely by geological processes, not by the astronomical processes of how they were created. So. Yeah, I know you're not a uh, LIGO collaborator, so feel free to plead ignorance on this. But um, do you know, with the uh, additional observatories coming online, like Virgo, what's the improvement they've been able to achieve in um, locating these sources on the sky recently? Yeah, so I, I didn't get into that. Um, so it, it's LIGO, the two telescopes on their own, don't tell you very well on the sky where things are. Um, a sort of analogy is that it's sort of like hearing with your ears. You can tell roughly where something is coming from, but figuring out exactly where the sound is coming from is hard. So it helps to have more telescopes distributed across the Earth uh, to pinpoint exactly where on the sky the source came from. So in fact, for the colliding neutron stars, Virgo was operational at that time, and Virgo didn't see the colliding neutron stars. And the fact that Virgo didn't see it was actually useful because it turned out that only if the source were in a certain part of the sky would Virgo have not been able to see it. Had, and I, I don't really, I'm going to make up directions, okay? But basically, had the source been over there, Virgo would have seen it. If the source was there, Virgo didn't see it. So the fact that Virgo saw it told us that the source was there. And that really helped, actually, in telling the electromagnetic astronomers with normal telescopes where to look on the sky for the light associated with this event. So now, LIGO is actually currently operating now. It's detected. Um, they're now publicly releasing their uh, observations as they go. It looks like they've now detected a collision of a neutron star and a black hole. So there was a lot of excitement in seeing that paper come out uh, eventually, whenever that happens. Um, and they've detected more, two more colliding neutron stars and a, a number of additional colliding black holes. And Virgo is now part of that uh, worldwide effort to detect the gravitational waves. And as it'll actually... There are additional telescopes being built in India, Japan, um, and as more of them come online, we'll be able to know better on the sky uh, where things happen, which will be very useful in figuring out where to point our telescopes to look at after the collisions. Kind of a related question, but the uh, neutron uh, collision that was detected, how was that first found? I mean, and all of a sudden you got all of those telescopes that have to be coordinated and aimed in an event that doesn't have a lot of time. Okay, so the first found is actually a great, it's a complicated story. So I'll give you the chronology of how the information actually got to Earth. And then there's a slightly different chronology of how the information was disseminated to astronomers. The chronology of how it got to Earth is the gravitational waves were detected. About a second later, there was a flash of gamma rays, okay, that was detected by a satellite orbiting the Earth. About 12 hours later, the visible and infrared light was detected. A few weeks after that, uh, the radio waves were detected. Somewhere in that, I'm totally forgetting them, the x-rays were detected. But that's sort of roughly the chronology. And you'll notice that the, it went gamma rays, visible, radio in terms of time. And that sequence is also the sequence of the wavelength of the light. Gamma rays are shorter wavelengths than visible, which is shorter than radio. 
And that's related to the fact that the gamma rays are produced in a smaller region of space where things are hotter, so they come out earlier. The visible is produced when the gas has expanded a bit more and it's a bit cooler, and the radio is produced when it's expanded even more. Okay. And so that sequence of when the information got to us actually is a time sequence of how the expansion of this debris cloud was happening. And then, yes. And so what actually happened, it turned out to be a little bit more complicated, the gamma ray telescope announced things first, and then LIGO announced it as well, and that's just kind of complicated details of, of really who analyzed the data when and, and some issues about noise. I'm curious about how wave-like the gravitational waves are in the sense of are they subject to refraction, diffraction, dispersion? Do they make a spectrum? Is, there, is it one exact frequency like, the, like H alpha or, right. or is there a spectrum spread? So, so gravitational waves like light uh, come in many different forms, many different wavelengths. And so LIGO is sensitive to a particular range of wavelengths or frequencies that you can detect from the ground. Roughly 100 hertz or so uh, gravitational waves. So meaning gravitational waves where the pattern re repeats itself 100 times a second. Um, there are other sources that produce gravitational waves at different frequencies. So for instance, if you have two million solar mass black holes collide, I mentioned that takes much longer to happen, more like hours. So for that, you actually need to put, we think, telescopes in space. And so there's a European mission called LISA, which is designed to detect um, gravitational waves from space. So yes, very much like light, Gravitational waves come in a range of frequencies, and those frequencies encode different information about the universe. But, but unlike light, uh, so gravitational waves do undergo lensing, meaning if you have a source of mass there, the gravity of that mass can bend the direction of propagation of gravitational waves, but they don't undergo, say, refraction or they don't really interact much with matter. So they don't have a different index of refraction in the way that light does when it interacts with different matter. So, yeah, great question. Two questions. Given the amount of heavy neutron or neutron rich elements in the Earth, and our best guess about what that means for other planets throughout our galaxy, has anybody made a guess at how many neutron stars have collided in the last 13 billion years? So if we take, so most of the heavy elements are actually in the sun, um, not in the stars, not in, in the planets. So if we take the total amount of basically all of the elements in the periodic table above iron, roughly, in the galaxy, is about 10,000 times the mass of the sun. And so we probably need about a million neutron star mergers in the history of the galaxy to produce all of those elements. So those are rough numbers, uh, but that gives you a rough sense of how many there probably have been. Second thought, does that change our understanding as to the creation and source of neutron stars given the kinds of numbers you've just talked about? So most, most neutron stars don't end up close enough to each other that they spiral in by radiating gravitational waves away and collide with each other. Most neutron stars are sort of out there by themselves on their own. Um, so the present, the detection of the colliding neutron stars doesn't really change our understanding of the raw number of neutron stars that there are in the galaxy, because most of them are isolated and not in these binary systems like the, the ones I talked about here. So. In regard to the periodic table, are there any elements that are not accounted for in this scenario? Yeah, and, <laughs> and you know, I... I I glossed over, of course, many interesting details. Um, there are 
You know, there's still puzzles. Neutron star mergers might not be the only source of these neutron-rich heavy elements. There might be some unusual stellar explosions that do it. And there are some elements where the models we have today for stellar explosions don't produce enough of that element to explain everything we have. Probably the answer is that there's some variant of how stars explode that we don't quite understand yet that produces that element, but it could be there's something more exotic out there we haven't discovered yet that is responsible for it. So there is, you know, I would say this is a case where we made a lot of progress on our zeroth order understanding of the problem, but as always happens in science, that really does open up a lot of other interesting questions. So it's not like all the questions have gone away. Even in this area, this has opened up a lot of interesting kind of problems that we're still grappling with. So. Just a quick question. Would you happen to know the distance that the mirror shifted with the collision of the 230 solar mass? Neutron stars? Uh, that's a good question. The, how much the distance shifted? So what was the strength? 10 to minus 19? Yeah, about meters, right? Yeah. <laughs> about, I uh, had to check units. Um, about 10 to the minus 19 meters. So, I mean, it's just, which is just mind-boggling, right? Totally mind-boggling that that's detectable. Do the gravitational waves travel in all directions, in the plane of the spin, or perpendicular? So they travel in all directions. They travel a little bit more um, in the direction perpendicular to the orbital plane, so in the sort of sense of rotation. There's, the signal's a little bit stronger there, but it's basically in, in all directions. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Um, given the... Um, extreme circumstances um, in the explosion itself. The heavy elements that were created by that explosion, are these um, isotopes, say, of, of uranium, or was that not studied, or is that a subject of ongoing or current study? And then the fellow up here <coughs> asked my other question about, I was, you know, con um, wondering if other elements were um, created, you know, such as common things like carbon, hydrogen, water, et cetera. Yeah, so but the, I, I'm specifically wanting to know about the isotopes. isotopes. So the question is, um, first, I'll answer the easier part. Um, are common elements like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen produced in, this, in the collision of two neutron stars? And the, the answer is no. It really is the very heavy elements in the periodic table. So then the other question um, is about isotopes. So that's the fact that elements we define an element by the number of protons it has. So helium has two protons. Uh, but helium comes in different versions. There's the normal helium, which is two protons and two neutrons. There's also an isotope of helium, which is two protons and one neutron. And so uranium has many, many, many isotopes. Um, and so the answer is that uh, there's a lot of different isotopes that are produced. So it's not just, in fact, you know, it's not just the isotope of uranium that has a four and a half billion uh, uh, half-life that's produced. There's many, many, many different isotopes that are produced. In fact, there's many elements that are created here that are at least temporarily created that uh, have never been created in, in laboratories on Earth. So this is going to be some technical mumbo-jumbo, but uh, that's past the neutron drip line. So very, very, very neutron-rich elements, which aren't even stable, that can get temporarily created, and then they fall apart. Those are created as part of this process of building up the heavy elements. You create a lot of very unstable stuff, and then over time, it decays back. And so as time goes on, you're left more and more with familiar stuff because all the unfamiliar stuff has a short half-life and has decayed away. All the rare ice, radioactively unstable isotopes have decayed away. So, great question. Um, did the Big Bang create gravitational waves and would LIGO be able to detect them? Oh, that's a great question. Somebody might have planted him. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the answer is quite... Quite, quite possibly, quite likely that the Big Bang did create gravitational waves. Not 
in the way that I described, because the Big Bang is not two black holes or neutron stores orbiting around each other. Um, it produced them by some fundamentally different process. Um, there are ways of detecting those. Um, the expectation is that that's not going to be detected by LIGO, but that instead other studies in particular of what's called the cosmic microwave background are the best way to actually try to detect the gravitational waves produced in the Big Bang. And that's an incredibly uh, active and exciting area of research. So. Yeah. so by the time the gravitational waves get to Earth, the change in gravity is like extremely minuscule. Yes. How large is it when you're actually near the source? Could you actually feel it, assuming so, you don't get blasted away by the... Right, so if you, were, if you were like sitting on the neutron star, which <laughs> for various reasons I would not advise, um, you would definitely feel it. Um, but gravity is actually a very weak force. So we think of gravity as something that's very powerful. It's holding us here on Earth. It's holding the Earth together. But of all the forces in physics, it's actually the weakest. And so uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, I should, I don't, the exact distance away from the collision you would have to be where you wouldn't really notice the, the gravitational waves sort of stretching in any way. Um, but because gravity is weak, you actually don't have to go that far away before the signal doesn't have much of an effect. I think the the bright source of gamma rays, for instance, would be more dangerous than the gravitational wave. So, yeah, good question. So, considering the elements are made in space, how do they end up in the human body? So, how did the elements end up in the human body? It's a uh, it's a long process, but the, I think the zero, the the first kind of the astronomical part of the story is gravity. So there are some clouds of gas. This is an actual, this is one of the, the famous pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope called the Pillars of Creation. This is a region where new stars are forming. And the way that we think stars and planets form is that there are clouds of gas where the gravity of the cloud of gas itself is able to cause the cloud of gas to collapse in on itself. And so it collapses and collapses and collapses and it gets denser and denser and denser until eventually it forms a star and a planet with uh, a star with planets orbiting around it. So gravity fundamentally takes that material that was spread out over space and concentrates it. It really is a, a sort of runaway rich get richer process. Regions that have a bit more gravity are a bit more massive, have stronger gravity, pull in more stuff, and then their gravity gets stronger, and they pull in more stuff. And that runaway uh, enables gravity to concentrate material into stars and planets. And then, once you have stars and planets, uh, I will defer to my biologist colleagues to explain <laughs> how you go from uh, a planet to uh, humans, because that's a really hard you know, biological problem about the origin of, of single-celled life and multicellular life and all of that. So, but the astronomical part of the story, I would say, is basically gravity. It's the raw materials. It's the raw materials, right? That evolution just sort of then, I mean, I think once you have some life, we understand at least broadly how evolution can change things. But the first step of getting the first life is a particularly challenging question. So. Well, I'd like uh, to thank Elliot once again for this 